less than unique, but a uniquely bad computer law called the Digital Millennium Copyright Act, or DMCA, of 1998. Uh, and and um, particularly a clause in it that says that removing digital locks is illegal. So if there's a lock that restricts access to a copyrighted work, it's against the law to remove it or to weaken it or to help people remove it, to share information that might uh, help someone remove it. Um, and, and not just a little illegal, very, very illegal, a $500,000 fine and a five-year prison sentence for a first offense. And the reason for this was to kind of spur on what back then was a kind of buzzword that went right along the, uh, with the information um, superhighway, which is the information economy. Uh, in 1998, we had this idea that we were going to create this uh, kind of infinite uh, derivatives economy, kind of like, like subprime for data where we would be able to take a thing that today was worth uh, a few dollars, like one of my books, and subdivide it into a million exotic sub-products, like uh, my book, but only on Wednesday for 10 minutes if you're standing on your head in the part of Boston that's Temple Street, but not the Temple Street that I went to tonight. Right? <laughs> and, and that would be a thing. That would be a contract, and you could buy and sell it, and it would be different from all the other ones. So you would have movies that you could watch but not save. You had movies that you could save but not watch when you traveled. And we would find the offer that suited every person, and we would subdivide information infinitely. What this amounted to was a way of charging you for stuff that you that you used to get for free. Right? It, 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 if you had a movie that you could watch anywhere, now you would get a movie that you could watch some of the time. And if you wanted to watch it again, you'd have to pay again. And that actually bore fruit. We live in that world today. So um, if you happen to have a, a computer with an optical drive, and you stick a CD in that optical drive, the manufacturer supplied software will wake up and say, would you like to rip, mix, and burn the CD so that you can load it onto your phone? Um, that comes from the manufacturer, and it's possible because there's no digital lock, so there's no reason to break a digital lock. And that activity is legal. Moving your media from one device you own to another is perfectly legal. If you put a DVD in your computer, the only thing you can do with it is the same thing you could do with it in 1996 when DVDs were invented, which is watch it. Right. It's a, uh, another amazing situation that has obtained that in 19 years, not one new feature has been added to your DVD. Now, there is a way to watch your DVD on your phone. <coughs> you buy it from an online store. You buy a thing you already own again. So that's uh, the information economy as it's come to be known uh, since the passage of the DMC in 1998. And there's lots of reasons to worry that it's a, that it's a ripoff. Um, now, as an artist, uh, I might support this in my own kind of venal self-interest if indeed it could actually make people buy things that, uh, twice instead of just once continue to pay me for things that they wouldn't have had to pay me for before. But as a technical matter, these digital logs don't actually work very well. Pirates don't have a problem circumventing them. So for a digital log to work, um, I need to scramble a movie, for example, and put it on a DVD, and then I need to give it to you with some tool for descrambling it, a DVD player that has the keys to descramble it. And the only way that I can keep you from making a copy of that DVD that you can share or move to your devices or do any of the other things that might harm my interests as the rights holder, the only, the only way that that works is if you can't figure out where in your DVD the keys are hidden. Now, you may not be able to find out where in your DVD player the keys are hidden, but someone can, right? Someone out there in the world can. And if you are someone who wants to find out where in the DVD player the keys are hidden, all you need to do is buy a DVD player. They're $37 this week. We just moved to Los Angeles and needed a new region-free one. $37 this week to buy a DVD player. That's the price of admission to join the egg hunt for the key that's been hidden in the DVD player. And so normally in cryptography, we have Alice and Bob and Carol. Alice and Bob want to share a message, and Carol is trying to eavesdrop on them, and Alice and Bob do some fiendish and clever things to stop Carol from receiving their message. In crypto, there's, in, in DRM and digital locks, there's just Alice and Bob, right? Alice wants to send Bob a message. Alice hopes that Bob, uh, or Bob hopes that Alice doesn't look too closely at that message and figure out where he's hidden the keys. Hiding the keys in, in tools that you give to your adversaries doesn't work for the same reason that hiding the safe in the bank robber's living room doesn't work. <laughs> it doesn't matter how good the safe is, because the bank robber can bring in any equipment that she wants to try and open it. And it doesn't matter how well you've hidden the log. 
because if you're a board grad student at a Big Ten with your own electron tunneling microscope and a bunch of uh, undergrads hanging around like a bad smell and nothing to do for the weekend, you can take a crack at where that key is. And so as a consequence, none of these logs have worked. Now, it wouldn't be a big deal if all this was was a ripoff that affected people who were law-abiding but not people who weren't law-abiding. It would be a small deal, but, but not a big deal. But it is a big deal. The reason it's a big deal is we have exactly one security methodology that works, one way to find out whether a system is genuinely secure, and that's disclosure. If you make a security system and you want to know if it works, you have to tell other people how it works so that they can point out the dumb mistakes you've made. Anyone can design a security system that works against themselves. But unless you're the smartest person in the world, all you've done is designed a security system that works on people stupider than you. And as a consequence, our only method for finding out whether or not a security system works is full disclosure. And that's a method that's obtained since the Enlightenment when we started to do this in all of our sciences to figure out whether or not we made mistakes. And um, the DMCA and uh, Section 1201, the anti-circumvention section, criminalizes revealing security flaws in these devices that have digital locks on them. Now again, if all this was about was entertainment, it wouldn't be a big deal. But a funny thing happened on the way to the 21st century. Your entertainment devices became much more than entertainment devices. You have a distraction rectangle in your pocket that lets you throw pigs at birds. But it doesn't just let you throw pigs at birds. That distraction rectangle has a camera and a microphone, and it knows everything you've ever said in its presence, potentially. And the only way you know whether the camera is switched on or off is whether you can trust what the operating system is telling you. And you take it into the toilet, and you take it into the bedroom, and you, it knows who all your friends are, and it knows where you go with them, and it knows how to log into your bank's website, and it knows how to get into your medical records, and it knows how to uh, get into the emails that you exchange in confidence with your attorney. So um, we have compromised the security of these devices that have become genuinely ubiquitous, that are not only in our pockets these days, but even in our bodies. Every three years, the Copyright Office hears from researchers who would like an exemption to this rule. And this year, they heard from researchers who work on insulin pumps and artificial limbs and other forms of medical implant. You have potentially computers in your body that have security vulnerabilities that you're not allowed to know about because the manufacturer has put a digital lock on it so that they can make sure that they're the only ones who can supply your doctor with the software to read the telemetry off of it. And um, uh, 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 Rapid7 uh, is a security research outfit, and their chief security officer who filed on this docket uh, is a type 1 diabetic. And he will not get an insulin implant, which will add years to your life because human beings are terrible lab technicians and we're not good at sticking ourselves and measuring and, 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 uh, and giving ourselves our insulin. He will not get an insulin pump. He will take years off his life willingly because he's audited the code in the insulin pumps that are on the market. They all have wireless interfaces and he's concluded that they are not fit for human use because uh, wearing one of these would allow someone to kill you in your boots from 30 feet away. So rather than take that risk, he's prepared to go on being his own lab tech to make sure that his insulin levels are in balance. And it's not just that we have these computers that are, whose security we're not allowed to um, inspect or report on or discuss in our bodies. We have our bodies inside of them. Right? Your building, if you live in a new high rise, probably has seismic damping in it. Seismic damping is a fancy word for a computer in your building that tries to uh, adjust dynamically to stresses from wind and seismic shifts. Um, if you have a computerized uh, HVAC system, heating and cooling system, um, that heating and cooling system has the power of life and death over you depending on the season, especially here in the sunny, cold, freezing, boiling northeast, right? And um, whether or not that system is secure is a great moment to you. And once again, it's a system that increasingly you're not allowed to inspect because your smart thermostat is owned by your power company and your power company wants to be able to turn it down by one degree or turn it up by one degree depending on the power load on the grid. It's a very noble thing to want to do. And to make sure you don't turn it back up again, they put a digital log that prohibits you finding out how it works. Um, not just buildings, of course. Uh, you may
they've seen that Chrysler recalled 1.4 million cars that could be remotely controlled over the internet so that their steering and brakes could be operated by untrusted parties over the internet anywhere in the world and run you off the highway this summer. Uh, Ford's locks can be opened by anyone with a $19 device called a roll cage. Uh, you, of course, know about Dieselgate, where uh, the uh, most grotesque disaster in automotive history to date is unfolding before us. Uh, Volkswagen has digital locks on their cars. It makes it illegal to inspect the software. And thus, they were allowed for years to get away with not only poisoning the world, which we all know about, but also poisoning the drivers, right? If you've been warming up your VW diesel in the driveway while your kids were banging their, arm, their hands against their arms while you scraped the windows in the winter, they've been breathing in dangerous levels of uh, emissions from your car's diesel as well. So this is a disaster, and we need to do something about it. Because it's not going to get better, it's going to get worse. Across the bridge at MIT's Media Lab, they have a prosthetics lab run by a guy named Hugh Hare, who does a wonderful presentation. You should see him speak if he's ever speaking locally. He shows you all of the things that they do in the lab, all the different ways they've combined computers and humans' bodies to make their lives better in ways that we could hardly imagine. And then his last slide, spoiler alert, his last slide is him climbing a mountain and in the slide, you see that although he's been walking up and down the stage the whole time, he's had his legs off at the knees, on both knees. He's had radial amputations on both legs at the knee. Uh, he says, I'm a mountaineer. I lost my legs to a frostbite accident. And he starts running up and down the stage like a mountain goat, having rolled up his trouser legs to reveal that he's robot from the knee down. And when I saw it, the first question I asked was, who can afford those? And he said, why anyone, even if they cost as much as a brownstone in lower Manhattan, if it's a choice between a mortgage on your legs and a mortgage on your house, you'll take the legs every time. Well, there are a million subprime cars on the road in America. These are cars whose uh, lenders uh, found people who were poor credit risks, issued them loans, and then to make sure that they could securitize those loans and issue bonds based on them, and that the bond value wouldn't fall because people defaulted on them, they installed networked ignition overrides on them. So if you miss a payment, your car starts shouting at you, you're a day late on your payment. And if you are too late in your payment, your car just won't start anymore. Well, imagine what it means to have subprime legs. Right? Imagine what it means when the repo depot can walk you back to take your legs away. And then think about the fact that uh, since these subprime cars have rolled out over and over again, car dealerships have had their computers broken into and their entire fleets immobilized. And then ask yourself what it means to live in a future in which you have computers in your body that you are legally enjoined from understanding, that you are that you um, don't own, that have the power of life and, life and death over you, and that are designed to keep secrets from you and to operate in a way that's adverse to your interests. So that's the subject I'm interested in. That's the thing I've gone back to the Electronic Frontier, to work, Frontier Foundation to work on. And that's what I hope we'll talk about tonight. Thank you. Hey, uh, what an honor it is to be here, and a humbling one as a member of the law faculty, because Cory Doctorow's work, in particular his advocacy in the areas of copyright and cyber law policy, has often engaged in trenchant critique of the law that is deeply needed and absolutely necessary to our efforts to meet the challenges and opportunities of a world increasingly connected by the internet of things. For instance, I think there is an imperative posed by uh, what Corey has in the past called the coming war and civil war over general purpose computing in which the rights of owners and users of computers come into conflict as we find ourselves relying more and more often on computers which we may not personally own, but which nonetheless perform the most personal functions in our lives. The computers we put our bodies in, cars, our homes, the computers we put in our bodies, hearing aids, prosthetics, medical devices. And that imperative is that we look to all of the tools that the law has to offer to balance the rights of users, owners, and society as a whole and not merely to direct regulation. As I think the harms of direct regulation, particularly where it relies on digital rights management, have been made clear uh, by Corey's advocacy. So what am I talking about? What, what kinds of uh, tools have I been inspired uh, to think about? Well, we might look to the law 
uh, to require industries to improve transparency for consumers rather than restricting information when they are making decisions in the marketplace that affect their privacy and cybersecurity. Um, Corey mentioned the um, hacking of the Jeep Cherokee. This summer, well, in response to that, Senator Markey has proposed a bill, the Security and Privacy in Your Car Act, that not only calls for the NHTSA and the Federal Trade uh, Commission to develop minimum standards of security, but also requires transparency and consumer choice in opting out of data collection and retention. Now, we might wish for a requirement to opt in, which is what the bill requires for uses of such information for marketing and advertising uh, purposes. Um, so that's a start. Uh, the bill also requires the labels under which cars are sold to include a cyber dashboard that informs potential buyers or leasers uh, of the car uh, about the levels of cyber security to the extent that they exceed the minimums in an easy to understand uh, graphic. And we can hope that increased transparency <coughs> will increase consumer choice in a competitive market. At least this proposed law's interest in informing the public seems a step in the right uh, direction. When it comes to vindicating consumer or user interests, it may also be time to revisit the enforceability of mandatory arbitration clauses and class action waivers in unnegotiated agreements, mm -hmm. uh, such as terms of use and click-through uh, agreements, which limit consumer access uh, to the courts and to class action when corporate providers of products and services breach contracts or cause injury uh, through negligence. And I think access to courts generally is one of the issues that Corey's work has encouraged us uh, to revisit. Now, whatever legal tools that we look to in order to achieve the right balance, the one indispensable tool is a fulsome democracy informed by an understanding of the potential benefits, opportunities, costs, and harms raised not only by the technology, but also by the proposed legal tool. Too often, this kind of discourse is dominated by stakeholders in industry or state security, and under those conditions, the law is not able to find appropriate balance. On this front, Corey's work is crucial, and our future need not be dystopian, where such voices help to drive our anticipation and understanding of the issues posed by our new reality. So I look forward to our discussion. Thanks for having me here tonight, uh, and uh, thank you for this generous introduction, and thank you, Corey, for uh, speaking so eloquently about the importance of legal control of our devices. Um, I certainly don't want my devices under anybody else's legal control, um, but as hard as uh, we will fight for not giving legal control for others, it will be even harder, I think, to make sure that we retain control ourselves. Mm -hmm. We don't know what our devices do today. And there are technical reasons to believe that we may never know, no matter what legal regime comes. What I'm saying is that disclosure, transparency, is necessary, but it's not going to be sufficient for us to make sure that our devices do what we want them to do. Let me explain what I mean. Today, no person can build a functional modern computer. Right? We have to trust many people who put our computer together. We've got hardware designers, we've got manufacturers, we've got assembly companies, operating system programmers, compiler writers, application software developers, they're all contributing to the devices you hold in your hands. And, each, and at each layer, as we know, it's possible to encode accidentally or deliberately undesirable behavior. For instance, hardware trojans. What's a hardware trojan? A hardware trojan is a hardware that's been deliberately modified to be malicious in certain cases. Hardware trojans are very possible, and in fact, they may be undetectable even if you can inspect every transistor on your chip. Uh, there's a result from a couple of years ago by uh, some of our colleagues at UMass Amherst and their collaborators in Europe, uh, Becca, Rickettsoni, Parr, and Burleson. They basically showed that a random number generator on your chip, which is what you use to generate cryptographic keys, can be slightly modified in a way that you cannot detect by testing the chip or by looking at the chip well. Um, so that the cryptographic keys your chip generates look good but are actually not so good and are breakable by those who know how the chip was modified. 
Um, so maybe we'll decide, all right, we'll just have our own trusted hardware manufacturers. We, we have to trust them, there's no choice. We'll, you know, we'll inspect them, they'll be good guys, they won't be the bad ones, you know. Um, do our problems go away? Because, you know, software code can be examined more easily than the tiny hardware that you need an electron microscope to look for. Unfortunately, what we actually inspect in software is usually source code. That's something that's human readable. Source code is then translated into machine code by programs called compilers. And back in 1983, in his Turing Award speech, Ken Thompson explained how a compiler can be modified to introduce a Trojan into the machine code of a program whose source code looks perfectly fine. Moreover, in a nice application of recursive reasoning, he showed how a Trojan can be introduced into the machine code that compiles the compiler. So even if you examine the compiler, it looks fine. You examine the thing that the compiler compiles, that also looks fine. But the thing that compiles the compiler introduces a Trojan that introduces a Trojan, and the ultimate thing that runs in your machine has a Trojan in it, even though you have not been able to detect it. So, right, so now we have to trust the compiler people also, right? We have to trust the hardware people. We'll only hire the good ones for that. We have to trust the compiler people. We'll make sure that those are good. What do we do then? In the recent uh, Volkswagen scandal, uh, the diesel emission scandal, right, several commentators uh, have posited that if only we had access to the code, nice smart people would have been able to look at the code and say, it's doing something fishy when the car is being inspected. It ought not to do that, and then you know, the whole thing would have come out or they wouldn't have done it in the first place. Um, but unfortunately, code can be made unintelligible. There's something in computer science called program obfuscation. What's program obfuscation? It's when you make a program obfuscated, hard to understand, right? And what the VW did was they produced code that checked if a rare special condition was happening, a very rare condition, the testing, not something that happens normally to a car, right? <coughs> and then, if that condition was happening, the engine operated differently. Today's technology, thanks to work that's about a decade old uh, by Canetti and Doug Duke, showed that it's possible to obfuscate such code. Give me any program that checks for a rare condition, and if that condition is satisfied, it does something. I can hide both the condition itself, what it's checking for, and what it does after the check succeeds. And I can hide it in a way that is provably impossible to understand unless you're lucky enough to hit the condition. So now you have a piece of software that tests for something. If something happens, it does something weird. You don't know what that something is, neither the test nor the weird thing that it does. That's today. In the future, and we actually don't know if it's possible right now, this is what my discipline is studying very actively in the past year or two, it may be possible to obfuscate even more sophisticated programs. It may be that the entire program is unintelligible, except for what goes in and what comes out. We don't know if that's possible, we're trying to figure that out, but if, if it is possible, then publishing code is not going to save us. Is it a necessary condition? I believe it is. Should we have legal control of our devices? I certainly believe it is. But that's not a sufficient condition for security, for real control, for real understanding of what's going on. You may say, you know what, I'm not going to run any code that's obfuscated. I'll just refuse. How many of you have used Skype? That's obfuscated code. It's not very well obfuscated, because cryptographers still haven't figured out how to obfuscate things very well. But it is obfuscated code, and we actually don't know what it does. So, I think we ought to fight very hard for legal control of what we do, what we use on our computers. Uh, but retaining technical control presents its own set of challenges that we haven't fully understood. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, yeah, thank you so much. Uh, also, as a professor of security, I think I can also comment and then I'll open the field to everybody. In the beginning, I thought of looking at the security aspect of that, but I thought uh, uh, probably that's not most appropriate for this audience. So what I thought of doing, taking like three minutes to do is kind of summarize what we've done by going through a stakeholder analysis. And at the end of it all, the question I'll be asking is, if uh, if it's digital rights management is so bad, why are we still handling it? Whose purpose, uh, <coughs> interest is it serving? 
and kind of revive God through most of the things that we went through. Uh, we saw the reason why the original intent, why they brought in the digital rights management, the whole idea of uh, controlling copyright protection. But from Corey and everybody else, the, 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 the answer was that actually this is not working at all. I have my security students here and a lot of the, what goes in in the digital rights management systems is cryptography, like, like Leo said. But we find actually they are not doing a good job. If you have a phone right now and you Google how to jailbreak any system you know, and I'm not asking you to do that, I'm not asking my students to do that. But if you are to do that, you find actually you can break, you can jailbreak any system that is out there. It takes minutes, not hours, to do that. And the code is out there. So, kind of we are saying it actually doesn't work. But it's still there. Uh, if you look from the other stakeholders, if you look from a marketing point of view, it actually doesn't work. Because if you think about it, what we end up doing is annoying the mainstream customers. If you think of uh, technology adoption, we are taught of, uh, we talk of the Rogers car, where you have the area adopters, the innovators, the geeks, and you also have the mainstream. And the mainstream customers is where the money is. So if you think of the digital rights management systems, the people who copy, a lot, I mean the people who is targeting, the people who it ends up targeting actually are the mainstream customers. Because the geeks, they know ways, they know they can Google, they understand the code, they can break that. So, and those are the people who don't want to pay a lot of money to copy. So even after having that, it still doesn't help them at all. The mainstream people are people working, family people, I mean people who would not want to commit a crime because of the consequences. So actually, you don't even need that. Most people, they are law abiding and they will not do it. Yet, when you put the DRM, the digital rights management, it's them that you add up harming. So if you think from a marketing point of view, it's not helping them at all, and actually you add up with annoyed customers. Leo talked about the security aspects. Even Corey talked a bit about that. And we saw it doesn't, even from a security point of view, when we think of protecting systems, when somebody puts a software behind the scene that controls your system, it also means that can also be used as a backdoor by hackers to control, I mean, to exploit the system. So even from a security point of view, it doesn't work. From a privacy point of view, again, Rebecca discussed this a bit, we saw it doesn't work. It's the fact that they are monitoring you, it means your privacy. Uh, you're not achieving confi uh, confidentiality or privacy. <coughs> uh, we're also preventing the gospel from being spread. If you think of marketing, if you think of social media, the way people recommend stuff, send it to your friends, because of the controls that they put, you can't share, you can't send, and uh, Korea, I know, covered these a bit. So, if you think from a legal point of view, even from the government point of view, again, the government is having a lot of pain. The laws they've created, they don't want, people are very angry. If you look at Congress, there's always been a lot of petitions to change that. So, once you look at the different stakeholders, you find even the companies themselves, they are not fine. They are not making, they are leaving some money on the table. There are a lot of customers that they don't reach out, uh, in this. So I guess the question as we open the, uh, the floor, I guess Corey, Corey could try to answer this, but also I'll throw the question out there, is uh, whose interest is the data rights management serving? 
and who will save us? Since we've discussed and we've seen that it is a big problem. If it was medicine, we know, maybe if it was food, we know FDA would come in. But now, who, who, who will save us? So, I'll open the floor, maybe, or we will take a time. Sure, uh, there, but this, the term is, is very loaded, the term property is very loaded, and it's become a, it's a word to conjure with in the 21st century. We've reified property and markets as the way to solve all kinds of problems, including problems we don't have, like, Markets for parking spaces and markets for, markets for restaurant reservations and markets for human organs and, and so on, which are all proposals that people who believe in markets as the sole tool for allocating resources have advocated uh, using markets in. So I think we need to push against it. I, I think that um, the way that I talk about copyright uh, as a way of trying to make sense of it is that copyright is conceived of and has been written of as the um, rules of the entertainment industry, which I'm a part of. <laughs> and there is nothing wrong with an industry having rules. Imagine how great it would be if the banking industry had rules, right? <laughs> um, and those rules might be good or bad. But even bad rules, if they were kept within the entertainment industry, would not be so bad, right? If the rules, if the rules about who owned what and what was conscionable and not in a contract and how long things lasted and whatever only applied to people in the industry, that would be fine. And for most of copyright's history, that's been what it was. And technically speaking, you weren't allowed to copy books, but that's like me saying technically you're not allowed to you know, levitate, right? The fact that it's a law is not why you're not doing it, right? Um, th the reason that you didn't copy books before uh, electronic uh, books wasn't that you didn't want to or that you were worried about the law or that the law was just, it was that like you needed a printing press, right? Saying you're not allowed to copy records when you need a record factory to copy records is another way of saying the record industry has these rules for who can copy records that apply to the record industry and the record industry alone. So imagine that we had finance rules that said like if you lend money um, and that amount of money is over $10 million, that is a financial transaction that has to be registered with the financial regulator, and there have to be careful records kept on both sides, you and the counterparty. And then we had Weimar style, style hyperinflation, and a beer cost $10 million. Buying a beer for your friend doesn't make you a bank, right? We had this idea that making a copy was a good proxy for whether you were in the entertainment industry. And what we did after hyperinflation and copying, because you all copy a million times before breakfast, is, um, we said rather than re-jigging where what we used to test whether you were in the entertainment industry, we would just apply entertainment law to everything we do with the internet, which these days is everything. <coughs> and so we have, we have arrived at this weird position where the rules that govern how Universal and Warner license Harry Potter back and forth for Harry Potter theme parks and Harry Potter movies are also binding on 12-year-old Harry Potter fans in their parents' basements in Worcester who are making Harry Potter fan websites. And not only is that 12-year-old never going to understand this very arcane body of law, but even if she did, and then sought to take a license from Warner, nobody at Warner would answer her phone calls. And if we made the system simple enough and streamlined enough for 12-year-olds to use reliably, Warner and, and, and Universal could never use it. It wouldn't be technical enough. So I think that, like, if we want to come up with ways to talk to people who care about um, the, the pseudo property rights of creative people, about where these rules should, how these rules should be drawn, I think asking them, how do you make a set of rules that can be uh, simultaneously complex, technical, and sufficient for industry, and simple and streamlined enough for children? And when they come to this answer that there's a then I think that's your moment to say, well then let's just let the industry have its own rules. They can argue, here are some ideas about what would be good rules and bad rules, but let's start with the idea that their rules don't spill over into our lives. Uh, and you know, speaking as someone who's pretty familiar with those rules, I'd be okay with that, you know? Um, I wanted to mention resilience as another piece of the puzzle here in terms of how we are secure both in our network communications and in our network world, in the Internet of Things. So 12 years ago now, the Federal Communications Commission said, you know, our radios these days are not a crystal in a circuit, they're a computer. 
And so all, you, all the difference between a baby monitor and an air traffic control system is the software. And this sucks, right? Because our regulatory model is that like before you make a baby monitor and sell it to the public, you come to us and we look at it and make sure it's not also an air traffic control system. And then we let you sell it. But if you could install any software you want on your baby monitor and it becomes an air traffic control system, the potential for mischief is limitless. And they propose that the, anything that could be a radio, which is every computer, which these days is every object, um, would have to be approved by the FCC and would only run software that was approved by the FCC. Mm -hmm. This is like a, a, this is a big job that they bid off for themselves and asked, what do you think of this? And a lot of people said that's a bad idea. And I asked a lot of people what they thought and how they thought we should solve it because it's a huge problem, right? Like if you ever want to be uh, on a plane that lands successfully or have your ambulance successfully dispatched to your house when you're in cardiac arrest, you need this problem to be solved. And so I asked a lot of people how to solve it. And Bunny Wang, who's uh, I mentioned before at MIT, um, he said, well, we already live in a world where radios misbehave all the time. What software-defined radios give us is the ability to figure out what's going on in our radio environment in real time and cooperate with other radios to find the radios that are going wrong. So radios go wrong because like, you set your radio down too hard and dislodge some of the shielding, and now it's also a spark gap generator. Or your, um, your, your old noisy vacuum cleaner is also emitting tons of RF that's clobbering your Wi-Fi or because you have a device that's a jammer, right? And there are all these different cases where, where this happens accidentally, on purpose, through wear and tear. Um, what if every radio device we had was always checking to see if anything was doing something weird or clobbering signals and logging it and narking it out and saying something bad is happening over there. I don't know what it is, right? And when a quorum of radios called the radio cops, or called a drone, or called the environment, which itself was smart, and said, figure out what's going on over there, because it's hurting all of us, then something would happen. That's a very resilient solution. And you know, emissions are much the same. Your Volkswagen, as I mentioned, wasn't just poisoning the world, it was poisoning you. We want cars that can sense their emissions, their own emissions, and the emissions of cars around them in real time continuously, and network with other cars to talk about what's happening to the air. And when that happens, then it doesn't matter if you accidentally put bad wear in your VW, or whether the supervised machine learning algorithm optimized into a state in which it said, if I hide from regulators, my, I get better mileage because you've, you've made a, a self-modifying program that has just come to this conclusion on its own, which is also a possibility. Or someone put in a zero where they meant to put in a one, and now this car is emitting all kinds of bad stuff. Whatever the answer is, we still need a resilient solution. It doesn't matter why it was done, except in terms of who you punish and how you stop it from happening again. But what you do about it once it's happening, and it's happening now because this city and every city are full of cars that emit more smog than they should be, the way that the what you need is you need lots of sensors that cooperate with each other that form a resilient response. And I think that that is an optimistic future for us.